Welcome back to another episode of Tank Talks. I'm your host, Matt Cohen. This week's episode, we revisit one of our favorite conversations from 2022 with Emily Lanetto of Webflow. It's always fun to reconnect with past guests and early success stories from our Ripple community. And today's guest is both. Emily Lanetto was a Tank Talks guest back when we were doing in-person Tank Talks back at the Tank. She was the first leadership hire at our venture portfolio company, Voiceflow, and now she is the director of community at Webflow, as well as a venture partner with us at Ripple Ventures. Emily has an amazing perspective on growth and community, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Now let's jump into the tank for this week's episode with Emily Lanetto of Webflow. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Emily. Thanks so much for having me. Emily, it's kind of crazy to actually have you on the show today because you were one of the very first persons that we had as a guest speaker of the original Tank Talks when we started this show out in 2019, hosting them physically in our incubator space called The Tank before we actually started this podcast. So first off, do you remember that? Oh my gosh, yeah, 100%. It was pretty crazy. That's how this all started. But you were also the reason why we even got started with the podcast because of how impactful that Tank Talk was that you gave to our founders and our portfolio companies. You know, you talked about growth hacks and you know how startups can and should think about growth at the early stage. But before we kind of go down that rabbit hole, it would be great if you can give our audience a brief background on how you got started in startups and how you eventually made your way into being one of the leading growth experts in the ecosystem. Awesome. Well, yeah, I think like many of us that end up in startups, uh, it's an unconventional nonlinear path. My background was predominantly in marketing. And when I first started out in tech, I realized that there was something that I wanted a little bit more than your typical marketing position um, in CPG or in top of funnel. Like I got really, really excited about building alongside marketing. And that's kind of what piqued my interest as I spoke more and more with people about growth as a whole and more specifically startups, since it's not just about optimizing, it's really about also building and finding your footing in the first place. So I started my career mostly in uh, top of funnel growth marketing originally at a company called Tilt until we got acquired by Airbnb, then found a love for product growth and activ- activation specifically around onboarding and consolation apps. And that really led me more towards marketplace growth and B2B growth, uh, where I then jumped on to help lead growth over at a company called uh, PartnerStack, formerly known as Grossumo. And that kind of continued to pique my interest in what are other industries, what are other spaces that can use similar tactics to really grow meaningfully, which then brought me towards Clio, helping lead experimental growth over there. And of course, into VoiceFlow, where Matt and I first met, uh, coming in back to grassroots of being one of the very first leads to join that team and help to grow what is now uh, their 50-person team. So very, very excited uh, that all of that has led me to where I am now. You know, it's amazing to hear the success you've had early on and then continue to have, even though you kind of think about it as like uh, you stumbled your way into some great opportunities. You really did have a nose and a knack for finding sort of the next up and coming, or you were a big part of why they became the next big early stage startup. But, you know, your first startup and your first growth role you mentioned at Tilt ended up with you being acquired by uh, Airbnb. Uh, And then your next product and growth lead role was at uh, GrowSumo, which later changed its name to PartnerStack where you were, again, the first growth and marketing hire before making your way over to Clio, which is one of Canada's fastest growing companies in the legal tech space. So from all of these roles from the very beginning to where you are now, you know, being on the front lines of the growth battle is sometimes some of the biggest challenges an early stage company faces. So what kind of lessons have you learned from all these roles that you still carry with you today? I think the the big thing that really has stuck out is that you can't know a hundred percent what is going to work, who is it going to resonate with, and how you can scale right out of the get go. One of the things that people love about growth is that it seems like it's this scalable key to getting this ridiculous hockey stick curve or exponential curve that we're all chasing. And very much so, like I think in a lot of ways, it can help you to achieve that. But the truth is, is that in order to get there, in order to kind of keep your yourself sharp, to keep your team humble, you have to still really, really focus on completing the whole picture with things that don't scale or still reminding yourself to connect with customers on a regular basis. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people in growth say that there is no playbook. And a lot of people in marketing say, well, there actually is a playbook. And it's very confusing. And people associate, you know, growth and marketing as the same thing, which I know is completely not. 
But, you know, how would you describe the difference between, you know, just basic marketing and the playbooks there and, and then growth and I guess the growth marketing, but let's just call it growth. Yeah. So I definitely think that there, there is kind of a little bit of both. Like there are foundational things that, Hey, like you can theoretically have a checklist of here are things that companies should have in their playbook in order to achieve a base level of growth or a base level of metrics to allow you to make those decisions. And I think like that, that's really where I think both in growth as a whole marketing as a whole, there, there are some playbooks there. I think where there are less playbooks available are when it really comes down to experimentation. And oftentimes when you look at traditional marketing versus potentially growth orgs is that that's often where the difference is, where an experiment potentially on a growth team could be something that involves uh, increased product work, uh, doesn't have data validation off the bat, or is trying to get data validation. Whereas often on the marketing side, yes, there's going to be campaigns that you're often shooting in the dark, but often they're really focused on optimizing rather than potentially building a net new function or a net new feature. That makes a lot of sense. And I think there's a lot more uh, variables that come out of the growth uh, mindset versus just a pure marketing mindset as well. And we'll we'll dig into that in our chat. But you mentioned after your time at Clio is where our paths intersected when you came over to join the amazing team at VoiceFlow as their first growth and community leader. So can you give our listeners some insight on what that role really entailed at the very early stage and how it scaled as the company started to become the leader in conversational design software and you know a, a huge success in terms of where it is today? Absolutely. So I think like also it's incredibly important to remember like when you join a company because different stages of companies, different industries all have different problem sets. With VoiceO specifically, I came on when there were six people building. They were very much so trying to find their footing in terms of who are we? How do people talk about us? Where within the market do we stand? And that's even comes before product market fit. It's like the confidence of being able to iterate who you are as a company. And I, I think my early stage growth career in a lot of cases, and this goes back to my first point here about there's some checklist items, was really about first establishing that foundation and making sure that we had a really strong brand. We had a way of creating a defensive moat that allowed us the freedom of starting to compete with otherwise pretty large players in the space. And so that's actually where growth and community came in for us at the beginning was we didn't have the luxury of traditional marketing channels of being able to target people for specific ads because we were targeting Alexa and Google users at the time. And it didn't become any easier when we targeted NLU, NLP, and advanced developers. (laughs) And so we had to create that. And we had to find ways that we could do that that wouldn't require us drastically expanding our headcount when we were small, seed funded at the time, and we're trying to deliver out a promise that, of course, Ripple was looking for us at the time as well. So that really pushed us into thinking about two things. One was establishing our foundation, our marketing playbook, who we stand and what channels we care about. Um, And of course, then also validating the users that we were going after. And we did that by actually creating a honeypot, which became our first community for VoiceFlow. And that was creating a space for people who are interested in designing and developing for voice to come in and have conversations. And that helped us get access to invaluable resources for product development, increased marketing messaging, and also just testing that your traditional startup without that honeypot wouldn't be able to get. You know, it's interesting because there was no playbook of other companies in the space doing something similar for you to kind of follow or kind of mimic because there was nobody really trying to take the lead in conversational design, building on Alexa and Google, you know, there was just nothing to follow. So you had to come up with everything yourself, but instead of just jumping in with both feet and trying to throw spaghetti at a wall and see what sticks, you really just listened for a long time and listened and learned from what the community was actually saying. And in the beginning, it wasn't even really a community. I remember, you know, hearing about some of these power users in Japan who are creating, you know, YouTube videos in Japanese on how to use voice flow and then creating like actual user manuals. I was like, wow, I had never understood the power of community until I saw what was happening with voice flow. But again, you weren't even thinking about about it as like a feedback loop for like how to innovate on the product. It was really just about listening to all the different things that they were looking for and doing with the product early on, right? 
100%. Like I think the the big goal of community, especially as you scale, of course, is product feedback, but more importantly, it's about building trust at scale. It's really about trying to build a better connection that's outside of the product walls itself. Because the people that use your product are going to be in hundreds of more conversations than you ever will be talking about your product. And you want them to advocate for you. You want them to have strong stories, strong connections, because that's what's going to ultimately build a much more genuine and much more defensive user base that helps you in the long term. Absolutely. So let, let's dig into the topic today, which is community building and growth hacks for startups. So to bring it all the way back to the beginning, like what the fuck is growth and why should people even care about it? Yeah. So, I mean, I think in a lot of cases, everybody to some degree does care about growth. And if not, you're, you know what, kudos to you. Maybe maybe you're working on something else. I would love to hear about it. (laughs) But I do think that the, the big thing about growth is really about finding both scalable ways that you're going to be able to take your company to new heights, but more importantly, also reinforcing natural and organic ways that people can grow. Uh, I think for a long time, there's been back and forth and lots of discussions around growth is this quick fix. It's a quick way of getting an easy buck or getting hundreds of thousands of new users. When in the reality of it, it's a balancing act. And I think in a lot of cases when startups or any line of company starts to think about growth meaningfully, they become experts at balancing that experts at understanding their resources, playing strategically based on what they have and experts at focusing because otherwise you're, you are going to be shooting out in the dark and the people that are fantastic at growth are the ones that have a lot of diligence on understanding what resources they have at play and understanding how to best actually uh, equip their team with them. It's also about not chasing like the wrong signals too, because I think a lot of people kind of in marketing are kind of thinking like, oh, like there's this like clear ROI down this path for, you know, generating more revenue or more users, whatever your, you know, KPI OKRs are. But sometimes that isn't sustainable and therefore you have this short blip because that was the, the signal you were listening to. But with growth, it feels like it's it's a longer horizon on how to build sustainable, repeatable, and like multifaceted you know, benefits for the company, not just sort of like one KPI for one part of the organization. That's the way I kind of think about it. Would you agree? Definitely. I think that their growth in a lot of ways is by taking a long-term abstract goal and breaking that up into a bunch of different micro experiments that ultimately build into channels that you can own, channels that are are long-term investments in on the company. And I think in a lot of cases too, sometimes those channels are not restricted to this will immediately impact signups or this will immediately do X. In a lot of cases, sometimes it's also about, like I mentioned with that balancing app, understanding that, hey, this is going to have, let's say, a return in a year or in two years, but it's important that we do this now so that we differentiate ourselves for the long term. And like, I think often that's where it becomes really difficult for a lot of people to really get that buy-in, be a strong, um, uh, be a strong proponent of pushing those proposals forward because they are hard um, to get buy-in in, especially as your company might be competing with resources. Yeah, I like the way you explain that, that long-term mindset. You know, I've also heard you say that before, when people think about growth marketing, they immediately think of dumb luck meets science. And I know that's not true. So how do you suggest startups get started thinking about it in the beginning? I think like th- this is really where I I love the concept of like, at the beginning to do things in the future that will scale, you have to do shit that won't scale. (laughs) Um, And what I mean by that is that where, if you don't do your research, if you're not talking to your customers, if you're not talking to people that you ideally want on your platform, it is dumb luck because you're, you're you're not researching. You're, you're not, you're not getting valuable Intel where oftentimes in particular at the beginning, you, you want to listen, you want to build up how are ways that you can, maximize the successful output of an experiment. And often that takes jumping on calls, doing research, watching log rockets, things that like may not seem super glamorous, but allow you to better inform the proposals or the targets that you're trying to go after. Because like we mentioned in this right at the beginning, like, yes, there are playbook elements of it, but there are variables that are incredibly custom to your product and your audience. And yet that is your job to be the expert in. So maximize for that at the beginning, and that will drastically help your playbook long-term. 
Yeah, doing things early on that are not scalable doesn't mean that they're wrong or shouldn't be done. You just have to accept the fact that they're not scalable. It's kind of like why they call it growth hacking, because you're hacking your way to get to some you know, end state that is where you want to be, but the path to get there is going to change constantly, especially at the early stages. But let's talk about some of the tactics, you know, about doing less with more with less and automating everything else. You know, can you explain what that exactly looks like in the real world and how you've accomplished that in your own career as a growth leader? Yeah. So I think it like, it starts small um, and it starts to build from there. The big things are like first in particular, let's say for a lot of startups, their headcount and their time is their greatest value. And, and I think in a lot of cases that continues to scale, your time is precious and you want to be able to take opportunities to automate the, the small things, the things that really pile up for you that end up taking away from heads down strategic time. So taking a look at first, looking at what are small optimizations like reporting structure or ways in which that you're getting data sent out. Are there Slack bots that you have in place? Are you using no-code tools to automate, let's say, scheduling? Or it seems so silly, but those things add up. And that first unlocks a ton of more brain power for you to focus on other things. I think more foundationally, however... It's about also taking a look at what are the tools that are going to help you accomplish the growth that you're looking for in your channels. So taking a look, let's say really early stage, you want to see what are easy ways that you can implement and own data, uh, ways that you can update your assets and make sure that they reach the right people. So let's say making sure you have good tooling for marketing site updates or a good CMS, and also taking a look at making sure you're investing in your knowledge for your team so that they also feel empowered to get access or to use tools that they can easily go in and be able to ship with. Because if you're building your company in a way where everything has to be a PR, everything has to go through dev, especially early stage, you're not going to have the velocity that you need to be able to ship and test as quickly as you need to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, decision velocity in all parts of an early stage startup are the most important things that we bet on. So in the early stages, it's all about product velocity. Uh, you know, and the sort of later seed stage, it's all about like kind of go to market velocity. And then, you know, with, you know, what you're working on in the growth role, it's all about how can you get more growth test out there. Uh, and by, you know, investing in those tools early allows you to scale faster, right? So we have a portfolio company like Marpipe that allows you to do variable testing on, you know, marking uh, design automation. So there's a lot of tools out there now that I'm sure was not around when you started off uh, early on in your growth career that now you wish you did have back then, but you do have now and other startups should take advantage of that, right? 100%. And I think like, I, I regularly talk about this concept of like building a growth tech stack. And I even, whenever I do conversations about it, whenever I talk to teams about, oh, what is my growth tech stack versus what is like, what are their options out there? Like the truth is that there are so many incredible tools in the no code and low code space that are enabling non-technical founders, teams, marketers, growth people, whatever it may be to accomplish things that historically have not been possible. Um, and they're becoming more sophisticated to the way where like I still regularly swap out things in my tech stack where if something's going to help me reach a goal faster and that's going to help the business that I'm working on hit its goals faster yeah like let's do it let's play with those and being in a growth mindset allows you that freedom to ideally be able to test out things like that too give me an example of some of the the hot tools that you're excited about using right now Oh my goodness. I mean, okay. So retool, fantastic one that I've been playing around more and more about. This is like a good example. Like I mentioned about automating your own time and making things easier for you and your team. Retool is hundred percent focused on building tools like that for your teams. Other ones are like, I'm just more and more excited about cloud and collaboration that becoming more and more of a function since historically there's been a lot of tools. Like I was Adobe Sketch diehard for a very, very long time. Um, and seeing the transition for a lot of creator or maker tools go into collaboration is automatically unlocking so much more, not just for like isolated building, but for team buy-in and, and for building together. So tools like Figma or tools that allow branching on top of tools that are historically uh, one player are also very, very exciting. And also it allows you, especially if you're working at like a software startup, to understand um, how you should be thinking about somewhat copying some of those ideas of collaboration and, you know, 
creativity in your own product, you know, like VoiceFlow did early on, thinking about the way that Figma had built out their own collaboration framework as well, correct? 100%. Like collaboration opens up brand new growth loops for so many different products. And I think in a lot of cases for companies that let's say cater to more of a single player experience, like you can accomplish multiplayer through yes, collaboration builds, but also through community or also through surfacing and through your content. Like this is a fantastic example of even what you at Ripple are doing with Tank Talks. Like this is an example of expanding beyond just the content that they would have in their internal system. So the more and more that we open up our minds to how do we build um, what I like to deem like the whole product, not just what happens from login to log out, is like that. that's really what people are buying into and expecting from SaaS nowadays. It's not just their isolated experience in their logged in session. Yeah, it really comes down to that long-term mindset of like thinking about what your users are doing on and off the platform all the time, which is important. So like, let's double click on some of these tests that people run. Like how should growth teams think about analyzing the tests that they're running to see why certain things are working and not working and how to make sure that you're not just relying on luck every time? Yeah. So I think it really comes down to being really diligent about setting up a framework, whether it is, okay, here's your one page hypothesis and making sure we're all speaking in a way where you can do some comparison to apples to apples, Um, but also being really diligent about review. I think in a lot of cases, people also in growth have a tendency to be shiny objects persons or people, myself included. Like it's always more fun to look at something that is more exciting and new, but sometimes like the most successful growth experiments are the ones that are not outwardly sexy. They're the ones where you're solving a really, really hard problem. And it's going to take several different tests to understand what is causing that problem in the first place. Um, so having a really good review cycle and celebrating the losses as much as the wins as a startup is so important. In order to unlock the ability to do experiments, you as a team need to be accepting of what are the things that we've learned when things don't always work out. And the reality is most startups feel that deeply. And it's an attractive thing for people who are working on startups to also feel like they have the opportunity to share. Yeah, it's exactly like how a product team uh, should think about, you know, their core ICP and also their non-core ICP or their their you know, positive buyer persona or their negative buyer persona. What are the opposites of what you're trying to target so that you know if you ever come across something that may look like the opposite of what you want, you don't go after it. Uh, and so you have to learn from all those tests that you're running, again, by focusing on not just the positive outcomes like everyone wants to, but also a lot of the negatives, which will be a lot of them probably early on while you're figuring out your process, correct? A hundred percent. And I think a big mistake that a lot of people make right at the get-go with startups is like no one gets into a startup because they don't fully believe in their product and they don't fully see this incredible long-term capability of serving ideally everyone. I'm sure you've heard it a million times. They're like, I'm building X for everyone. Um, the, the truth is in order to get to that long-term building a tool that can help virtually anyone in the world, it actually starts with focus on who is your your first or early adopter audience. So what is your early ICP? And it's also okay to understand that that ICP is going to mature. It's going to evolve. And there are ways in which that you're going to want to think about also in those review periods, like when have you hit a point in a maturity in your company that it's also okay to say no to customers, which I think is also like a controversial take when you think about growth, but often shutting down some of, uh, let's say, customer bases or different features that no longer suit the future of the company are also hard decisions that contribute to long-term success. Yeah, that's definitely one we should say for another podcast because a lot of companies go through that struggle. Uh, it's a hard decision to make, but oftentimes the right one when you start to narrow down your focus uh, from where you started off with the product. But, you know, I think we've understood the fact that growth sits in the middle of sales and product and marketing, but we haven't really touched on how community building intersects with all of those areas in your port- in your company. So how in your mind have you kind of evolved as a community builder in your own career and thinking about how community can intersect across the entire company? 100%. So I think that for me, community has always been something that has just either unintentionally fallen onto my plate or is something that I've naturally gravitated towards as a channel that drastically improves the success of our marketing, our sales, or our growth overall. And one of the things that really stands out to me as to why community is important for companies to think about is 
yes, because it's a fantastic place for product feedback, but more importantly, it's about building like strong empathy with your user base, your ICP, valuable knowledge, but more importantly, defensive, (laughs) a strong defensive moat, because the reality is like, any tool can be compared feature to feature. And as much as every tool wants to think that they are super special or that they're something that they can build that no one else can, oftentimes, like, if you built it on a coding language, someone else can build it on a coding language. The truth is that your users, how they feel about you, the experience and the user experience that you really care about there is what's going to drive that differentiation when people want to or don't want to go to bat for you, essentially. And community is a fantastic way of really productizing the voice of the customer, of driving that back towards or testing sales messaging out in the wild before it goes into their scripts, to partnering up and creating fantastic customer testimonial loops and more ways that you can get increased testing, beta users, things like that for product. And of course, with marketing, it allows also as an incredible source for distribution, go-to-market messaging, and of course, even swarming. Since you see, let's say, very strong examples, even at Tilt, when we launch things, we would always pre-launch things to our community and have them all queue up to go talk about it on the exact same day. And it was almost always a viral success because of that. And we would never have been able to do that with paid. Yeah, like a, like a focus group, you know, just like the way like Tinder would also do these like launches at different universities or drops, whatever. You know, there's there's all these successes of how communities can be a place of innovation, but also a place for uh, an unbelievable growth. But they're not always successful. I mean, you've worked at some very successful companies that have successfully launched great communities like Clio and Voiceflow. But what lessons have you learned early on of things that don't usually work out when b- building a community? So I think a big thing for for community is like, yes, it's a super hot topic. Everybody wants a community in the same way that everyone's like, yes, we want growth. We want all of these things. But the reality about community is that it isn't just about you and your product. And often it is very easy to go in and see whether or not a community is really built on uh, the users within it or whether it's built as an extension of the company itself. So what I mean by that is that there are very different types of communities. There are communities that are support oriented. There are communities that are conversation and connecting oriented. There are ones that are really focused on product. And there are ones that in a lot of cases are extensions of their marketing campaigns, like essentially a billboard. And I think often cases of really strong communities really boil down to a few things. One is it's not a side desk job. So if you want to start a community, you better damn be sure that you have resources to make sure that there's someone there to respond, someone there to set the habit, someone there to to be the host. Because it's very similar to hosting people over your house. It's one thing to invite them there, but you should be there to make sure that they have a good time. Um, The second thing is making sure that it's not just a one-way conversation, that you're building habits, that it's really more about a healthy ratio of them talking and you occasionally popping in with things every now and again. This isn't about you just having another marketing channel or another way to blast people. And then lastly, it's also about making sure that you are also bringing that back and advocating for the community in a regular way within your team. So in order to continue to secure resources, it's also important that you productize how you capture information from there. What are the metrics that you start to see getting pushed or opportunities to test within that community in more and more ways that it becomes more ingrained in your typical funnels of development? Yeah, I love that analogy. Like, don't have a house party and and don't show up, (laughs) like, and have everyone just party in your house without you there. Uh, You wouldn't want to do that with a community that you're not, you know, monitoring, engaging with, having two way conversations with. That's a really good point. A lot of people think they just sort of happen organically and they succeed organically, which is not uh, the case. You need to have people a part of it, managing it and curating it, uh, which is important. You know, what examples of communities have you 
uh, looked up to or like ones that you're just like so fond of uh, that you wish you were, you know, the one who created them or managed them? Yeah, I mean, there there are a ton. Like I think for for a really good example of like a productized community, I think like Figma's does, done a fantastic job at really just making sure that it's bent directly into their product experience, that their plugin developers are the people that build on top of Webflow. Or, I'm not Webflow, that as well. Figma is very much so uh, celebrated. I mean, I did have a little bit of a Freudian slip there, but I did have a ton of love and appreciation for the community at Webflow before I joined. Yeah, we'll get into how community is a part of Webflow for sure. Don't you worry. Yeah. I think like, I, I mean, definitely shout out to, to Webflow and their community. Cause that's often actually the very first community that I was a part of really. Um, when I was a solo marketer building and like hitting my head on the desk, trying to figure out how do I build a website that doesn't look like a Squarespace template <laughs> for a real company. And I think like, that's also incredibly important. Like theirs is very built on skill sharing. But I think other ones that really come to mind are like Alpha is like a fantastic one. It's like specifically for uh, female leaders in tech. Um, it started off as a small group of those that were involved with YC and has like expanded into like a fantastic network of folks that we're brought together, not by a product, but by us trying to grow together. And I think like that's also something that's really exciting about community is that it, you could be working on a product, but you could have a community that's built on the problem that you solve, not your product specifically. Um, and like Lattice's community is like a good example of that. They have one for like people leaders as an example. Yeah, that makes a sense. I mean, how many Slack or Discord channels have you been invited to if some type of community that have just totally gone dead after like a month or so of being a part of them? It takes a lot of work and people need to recognize that. So kudos to the ones out there like Webflows and Figmas and Voiceflows that have done a great job curating them. You know, but talking about some of the impacts that community can have on the company. You mentioned this before, but let's dig into this a bit. Like how can community driven companies leverage those communities to impact product and growth versus some of the traditional non-community based companies out there? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a bunch of different examples, like specifically around like like I mentioned with having strong programming for like voice of customer with it driving back and you actually leading and sharing reports with your product team, or even enlisting members of your community to be part of exclusive beta programs, to be focus groups, to build a community council. Like there are so many ways that you can really programmatize it and make them not only feel heard, but also like really, really empower them to be part of your development and what the company cares about. I think as well, like a, a good example that even we test at Webflow is like we have several layers of betas uh, that we go through, ones of which that make sense for us to launch fully out in the wild, ones that are super small and we need early feedback or ones that like we really want to build alongside with our community. And often every time that we're trying to do that validation, it always starts with, okay, yes, here's a problem that we may have received from a wish list or from a request from a customer, but let's go and find people that we can actually talk to and build this with. So then that way we are delivering on the promise of what it is that um, our community is actually looking for. And it also helps our teams that don't have as much exposure to them on a day-to-day -day basis, like engineers, to really understand what they're building for and better advocate for that, even when myself or members of the community are not involved. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, you've covered off a lot of the reasons why community is such an important thing. But oftentimes, like ourselves, you know, talk to early stage founders about the, the need for community, the power of it, and how it's important towards growth and all the things you mentioned. But they often have a tough time seeing the immediate ROI to the business. Uh, and it's a struggle for us, and I'm sure a lot of people out there, to convince these early stage founders to invest in community. You know, look at Webflow, where you are, Figma, Airbnb, so many companies that have such powerful communities are incredible successes, and the ROIs are obviously massive for them, but they're already far ahead from where the early stage startups are thinking about it. So how yeah. would you explain to an early stage founder the power of community and when is the right time to start thinking about it and investing in it if it's not easy for them to understand? Sure. So I think like the big misconception there too is like you don't need a lot of 
investment in order to have a really strong community. Also community, like it's so easy to look at companies like Webflow, like Figma, like Voiceflow even like, and look at, oh, how did they get there? Cool. Like they, they have all these things going. We need all of those things to get started. Absolutely not. Like it starts on like start small. (laughs) It could be as simple as start a community of beta testers. Who are your power users? Get them in a group together. Use them as a way to get closer with the product. The immediate ROI of that is, hey, you're testing it out, but they're literally your power users. Like It's a way of you getting increased feedback loops and a tightened uh, product development cycle, and that's going to be huge for a company. So that's like one example of trying to go through that or taking a look even as starting a community often like it doesn't need to start off with you literally hosting something or you literally being the place that they go. Sometimes like getting involved in community can be you starting up your presence elsewhere and taking a look at where do your customers already live? How can you now participate and have a wider um, spread within those user bases? Like a good example, like really, really early on with, uh, with VoiceLow was like Facebook was where a lot of people were talking about it because we originally were targeting parents uh, that were building for children's stories on Alexa and Google. So where do they live? Facebook. Naturally, let's go to Facebook because it's not going to take a lot of resources for us to get them there. And that, that changes no matter what type of tool you're on. With Webflow, it was forums. With Airbnb, it was Craigslist. Like there, there are so many different places that I think people also lose sight of sometimes when they think they have to own it right out of the get-go. Yeah, that's amazing advice. I was going to bring up the actual voice flow example of where, you know, they had to, you know, insert themselves into the voice community on Facebook without actually selling anything uh, and eventually had to acquire it uh, and take over the actual community because they were such a huge component of the conversation. But also, yeah, it doesn't need to be a a huge, significant dollar investment, um, like the way Airbnb had to get into Craigslist and Webflow was getting into, you know, chat channels and stuff for them to share uh, what people are doing with it. So I, I like that. Um, I think the hard thing for, for some founders is they just don't necessarily know where to start. And your advice basically is start small, go with your you know beta testers, design partners, put them together in a room, get them going, and you'll be surprised at what happens. I mean, look at us with our Ripple X Fellowship Program. It started with just seven students in the first cohort, and now it's over a thousand and growing, massive online community and people meeting up in real life and building great companies together. So just get started and and then start putting the guardrails around it once you've got something cooking. But I appreciate you sharing that advice with us. You know, one question I had for you is how is growth and community defined in your role now at Webflow? And how are you trying to leverage your experience as a growth leader and combine it with the mission of Webflow to achieve success? Absolutely. So I think Webflow is a fantastic example of a product line org that has been built with community in mind. Like they have been around for um, for a decade, have very much so been a huge proponent in not only establishing like no code as a community, but also just empowering web designers to become developers. And I think very much so a lot of that success is around the emotion of empowering everyone uh, to build for the web. And in a lot of cases, like our community isn't a hundred percent always about, okay, here's like what I'm doing on Webflow. It's about helping each other. It's about that empowerment mission. And so community is an incredible catalyst for Webflow, not only to better understand like how our over 80% of our users actually building on our tool, but more importantly, like what are the trends? What are the things that are evolving with them? Because just like our product is evolving, the world is literally also evolving. And the way that people work is changing. The economy literally changed. We support freelancers and agencies and their currencies all over the world. Like there are so many moving factors. And my focus in being able to really listen, advocate programming, build creator tools for community is about really finding ways to scale that voice and drive that continuously into whether we're working with sales, with PMM, with our CSTs or our customer support team. Or, of course, our education team, which very much so is built on activating and empowering even more folks. So it definitely helps to be in an org where all of us are really, really strongly uh, moving towards that goal. But that empowerment and that global side of things is really what's driving our overall growth. So it's what really drew me to this specific position as well. 
it honestly sounds like the perfect place for you to be given just sort of the global reach and the, the mission and the community driven aspects of Webflow. It's a culmination of like all of your roles combined into the perfect role. So I'm so happy for you to be able to land at a great place like Webflow and be the leader on the growth and community side. And also thank you for all the help you've given to our ecosystem and community and Ripple and our portfolio companies, especially VoiceFlow to get them thinking more about growth and community to hopefully achieve the same success that Webflow and all the other companies that you've worked with have in the past. No, oh, thank you so much. Um, honestly, Matt, like kudos to you in general. Like I, I know that you literally talked about this right at the beginning, but I, for those tuning in, I literally met Matt when I was deep into Clio, was so in love with what I was working on and was advising, uh, was advising VoiceFlow, this group of four guys who Matt had taken a huge chance on and the passion and the excitement of those founders, as well as you and your team, Matt, are really what like got me excited early on too. And I think what, what people also forget in early stage startups is like your community and thinking about selling that way is very much so similar. When you sell people on what you care about with your startup, why you care so much about the things that are in work and the things that annoy you and the things that are exciting, it's the same type of selling that you'll feel from your community too. So we probably all in startups are a lot more well-prepared to build that and drive that message than we think. Yeah, I, I really liken, uh, thank you for that, by the way. I, I really liken community to like the ripple effect. It starts small and it grows and it gets bigger and it starts changing rapidly all of a sudden. And then you see, look back, you know, 10, 10 years or something, you're like, wow, I can't believe where this has gone with just a, a simple a, a mission to have more people, like minded people come together to build great things. So uh, it's very uh, symbiotic, the community and the, and the ripple effect together. But uh, enough hugging it out there. You know, before we wrap things out, we always love to ask our guests for their fast favorites. So first off, your favorite podcast. Obviously, Tank Talks and also Reply All. <laughs> which, which one's Reply All again? Uh, Reply All is one of them by the Gimlet. Uh, some of their, like, their tech support ones in particular are hilarious to me. <laughs> okay, I'd love that. Check that out. Next, your favorite newsletter or blog? Lenny Ruchitsky's newsletter in particular for those that are looking for growth tips. Awesome. Amazing one. Favorite tech gadget? Probably my new iPhone. <laughs> the 14? Which one are you on? 14 Pro. Oh, the image quality is just unbelievable. Somehow it keeps getting better every time, eh? I, I feel like a cinematographer now. <laughs> you are. Favorite new trend? Probably the comeback of emo and alternative music. Oh, come on. Are you serious? Yeah. Early 2000s, Emily is stoked. <laughs> yeah. The big platform shoes, like the, the choker necklaces, like that kind of stuff? Maybe not the fashion, but okay. the music specifically. <laughs> Fine. The music, yes, not the fashion. Your favorite book? Moonwalking with Einstein. What's that about? Uh, it is a true story based off of a journalist that went to go cover the memory Olympics and ended up a year later learning from all the people that participated in winning it himself. It's Whoa. really, really cool. True story. True story. Very cool. That is super cool. Got to be a movie made of that for sure. I, I hope so. Honestly, I would watch it. <laughs> That's cool. And last but not least, your favorite life lesson. That change is made up of dozens of small iterations. Um, and often when we're scared of change as people, breaking things up into small pivots can often lead to massive change overall. Oh, I love that one. That's like my father-in-law says, how do you eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? That's how, uh, that's how it's done. And thank you so much to the OG of Tank Talks who got it all started from the beginning, Emily Lanetto, Director of Community at Webflow. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tank Talks. To learn more about this episode, be sure to go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify to find more detailed notes on this episode or to check out previous episodes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and a rating as it helps us out a lot. And hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new episodes come out. Finally, make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Matty B. Cohen or at Tank Talk Podcast to stay up to date on new episodes or to be a guest on our show. Till next time.